The Conditioned Scholar, a program from the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions in Santa Barbara. B.F. Skinner, Harvard professor and author of the best-selling book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, sees a solution to America's educational problems. All one needs to do, he says, is to improve teaching, to teach more with the same time and effort. In this program, he tells how his theories of operant conditioning, the same theories that provoked wide controversy when he described them in his book, can be and have been used successfully for this purpose. Dr. Skinner outlined his ideas in a speech he made while visiting the center for a conference held to discuss Beyond Freedom and Dignity. He delivered the talk under the sponsorship of the Continuing Education Division of Santa Barbara City College. Dr. Skinner. Education is in trouble. Costs have risen steadily, and in both the public and private sector, it has been necessary to cut back activities, to close schools in some cases, to ask teachers to take on larger classes, to take on less outside work. Meanwhile, there is more to be done. Children are to start school earlier. Special classes are to be set up for handicapped, for exceptional children. We're to allow people to enter college without particular qualifications. New subjects have to be taught to make curricula relevant and so on. Now, these matters pose, of course, very serious problems and many people are trying to solve them. My own field of what has come to be called the experimental analysis of behavior is, I believe, quite relevant to educational problems. And I should like to outline a sketch for you some of the contributions I believe it is making or could make. This is a, a scientific study of behavior. Much of it has been done on lower organisms, rats, pigeons, monkeys, and so on, although much is now being done on human subjects. It is done in simplified conditions, but by no means as simple as most people believe. In hundreds of laboratories throughout the world, very precise environments are arranged with the help of elaborate equipment. And in these environments, organisms are exposed to conditions and the changes which occur in their behavior are noticed. This is as rigorous, I think, as any branch of biology which deals with the whole organism. Results are reproducible from laboratory to laboratory, and as the years go by, the types of environments studied grow more and more complex. I believe there is no question that this is a substantial flourishing and rapidly advancing science of behavior. And it has had a certain spin-off, as it is said. One of the contributions it has made to education is to insist upon a clearer statement of the goals of the teacher, of the task of the teacher. What is the teacher to do? The traditional mentalistic definitions of the goals of the teacher have never been very helpful. How do you lead to a broader understanding of something? How do you impart knowledge? How do you induce the student to grasp relations and so on? The whole movement toward behavioral objectives in education has come from the experimental analysis, which argues that before you can bring about a change in behavior, you must specify what that behavior is and what form the change will take. And there are now uh, books for teachers which help them think over what they are there to do, what kinds of changes they are to bring about in the behavior of their students. The experimental analysis of behavior has pointed the way to bringing about these changes in behavior. The whole point in shaping and maintaining new forms of behavior emerged from this laboratory work. You can accept as your specification some extremely complex behavior on the part of an organism. 
And by breaking it down and analyzing it and arranging what are called the proper contingencies of reinforcement, you can eventually arrive at that behavior. But you do it by going through a series of approximations. Extremely complicated behaviors have been set up by the progressive approach to a final form of behavior through intermediate stages. The issue here, the crucial point, is that it is done by arranging consequences. It's not the old stimulus response formula or the condition reflex of Pavlov at all. It is a, a point made by Edward Thorndike more than 70 years ago that it is the effects of behavior which are important to an organism. When behavior is followed by the kind of thing called by the layman a reward or punishment, the behavior changes its probability. And that is the kind of thing which has now been studied and which is available to us in the generation of a new technology. The history of education has been largely punitive. The Egyptians, Greeks, and Latins all punished their schoolboys. In the Middle Ages, the classical sculpture of the teacher showed him with birch drawn, the, as the mason might be represented on a cathedral with a trowel, or the carpenter with a hammer, the teacher was represented with a birch rod. And that has continued down to the present time. Um, we may have given up corporal punishment, only to substitute some more subtle and less conspicuous forms. Now, that is with us mainly because we don't know what to do instead. And the discoveries which have been made in the field of what we call operant behavior about the power of positive reinforcement, I think are going to make a great contribution, or have already made a very great contribution to education. One example of what is meant by, by programming is to be found in the field of programmed instruction. This is widely misunderstood. There are certain features of a good program which are important, but they are not essential. You, a program does break material into small bits, it does allow the student to progress at his own rate, it does ask him to understand one stage before moving on to another stage, and these are all important. But the main thing a program does is to provide rewards or reinforcements for uh, the maximal number of steps taken by the student. When you work through a program, you are repeatedly reinforced for what you're doing. You are successful at every turn, and success is often in itself a sufficient reinforcer. To see how this works, you can take an extremely difficult subject and apply the principles. There is a film which shows a mongoloid girl with an IQ of about 50 learning some simple arithmetic. And it's an amazing film to watch because she does indeed learn to do simple arithmetic but there is also at the same time an extraordinary change in her as a person as the days go by. To begin with, she was not even able to identify the larger of two groups of objects, such as, say, three against four or two against one. Slowly that was acquired. Then she learns to add objects to make two groups equal and so on. At each step, she's reinforced for the successful act by being given a wooden ring, which she then puts on a spindle. And when the spindle is full, she has her choice of some goodies, some, some candies, perhaps a little objects which are reinforcing to her. This, these little rings become extremely important. She values them. She will put one on a finger and put the finger up and let it slide down onto the spindle, watching the spindle fill up, and she has her choice. She begins to form equations putting small groups together so that they equal a group over here and the equal sign appears and the plus sign appears and then numerals appear in place of objects and so on. And at the end of the film, you see her going up to a blackboard and someone has written a three and three and drawn a line. She looks at it for a moment, picks up a bit of chalk and writes a six underneath. Well, this, this is the kind of thing that would have been said to be entirely out of reach of that child a few years ago. 
But here it is going on, you can see it going on, and it is done entirely by breaking what you mean by arithmetic down into a behavioral analysis, a series of steps, many, many steps for a, a child of an IQ of 50, but with the proper reinforcers, the proper encouragement due to the reward she receives, she learns, she's proud of herself, it's an entire change in expression on her face and so on. Now that shows what can be done when you understand the techniques of shaping and maintaining behavior by reinforcement or reward. And to jump to the other end entirely, let's take a textbook in, in say, in medical school. I I've, I've know a very good textbook in neuroanatomy, which is used in medical schools. If you want to learn neuroanatomy, this is the efficient way to learn it. I had a colleague who needed to learn some biochemistry in his field. He had had none. He got hold of an excellent program text in biochemistry, and he said to me later, you know, it was amazing. In one week, I knew biochemistry. Well, he didn't know it all, of course, but he knew as much as he would have got out of a, out of a one-year course, and he did it in one week. And you do it also painlessly. You don't have to force yourself to work your way through programs. If I ever wanted to go into a new field, the first thing I would do would be to find a good program text. It not only is efficient in the sense that you master it readily, but it has that marvelous effect of pulling you forward because you see yourself progressing, you see yourself being successful, and see yourself knowing things today that you had no idea about uh, the day before. So programmed instruction is just a way of bringing these techniques of operant behavior to bear on the acquisition of repertoires, which have been defined as a statement of behavioral objectives. There is another field, equally important, and that is what is called contingency management in the classroom. How do you handle a group of students in a classroom? As you know, very often a classroom will these days get just about out of control. It's a good deal more of truancy, uh, absenteeism than ever before. Big cities have given up keeping rolls of attendance in many cases. Uh, it's very hard to keep children from talking out, running around, and so on. Hard to get them to bring in their homework, to do their homework at night and bring it in. These are the kinds of management problems which we are failing at the moment to solve. And there have, in many cases, been uh, calls for a return to, to punishment, the birch rod. I know one city where when a child comes in and hasn't brought his homework, he must hold out his hand and be slapped with a, with a ruler. Still goes on. This is because we have not been able to find positive reasons for doing the kinds of things that students need to do in order to learn. But that, those reasons can be supplied, and they can be supplied by simply examining the situation, finding out what in it is actually reinforcing, and then making those reinforcers or rewards contingent on the behavior you want. A very simple example of this was done by a, a teacher in a Lexington school, Lexington, Kentucky, who had had no particular training in operant uh, work. She had read a book of mine, and she, she came all the way up to Cambridge to tell me of her success. She did a very simple thing. She had a very difficult class. She was a black teacher, and these were black students from underprivileged homes and so on. They almost never brought in their homework. They would not sit quietly. But she decided to try reinforcement. And she did it the following way, which I thought was very ingenious. She told the students that at the end of the week, on a Friday afternoon, there would be a drawing. And the person who won the drawing would have a, a small prize, which she brought in on Monday morning. It might be a little transistor radio. One week when it was Halloween, at the end of the week, she had a Halloween costume. And the way you could get your name in this jar from which the drawing was to be made was to do what you're supposed to do. If you brought in your homework in the morning, you could write your name on a little ticket and drop it in the jar. If you sat down and got to work and, and did your assignment, as soon as it was finished and was correct, you wrote your name on a ticket and dropped it in a jar. On Friday afternoon, there was a drawing, and someone, of course, got the, got the prize. She said it changed her life completely. She said it cost her six or eight dollars, perhaps a week, for these uh, trinkets, <laughs> but um, it didn't. It didn't matter at all. She she had a, she had a perfect classroom. She never had to punish them. They loved her, and moreover, of course, they were learning something. 
because after all, there is some point in doing her homework. Something is supposed to happen naturally, not just the, con the contrived result of getting a chance at a prize, but when you do your homework, you have actually improved. You, you've learned something. This was a, a very simple example. I wouldn't recommend it as the only pattern by any means, but it was what one inventive teacher did who thought there was a chance to find something in place of punishment. And if you say, oh, well, but there's no natural connection between doing a few arithmetic problems and having a chance in a lottery, that's true, but there's no natural connection between doing a few problems and avoiding a, a licking, which is the natural uh, contingencies. Now, this is going on. Uh, people are finding more and more things which the teacher actually has that the student wants. That when you stop to ask yourself, if you are a teacher, what have I got that my students want? Sometimes a very discouraging question. But, <laughs> but you can find things. You can find things, a chance to associate with other, uh, other children, the uh, special extra desserts at mealtime, field trips, and so on. I myself would not object to paying students for right answers. I wouldn't pay them for coming to school. I wouldn't pay them for getting reports from teachers to take home to their parents saying they behaved well, as, been, as is proposed now in New York State. You have to make sure the contingencies are right. But suppose, for example, you decide that a, a, a child who does his homework is to get a little ticket which indicates that a credit will be given to his family, of which he gets 10% himself to spend. And suppose this amounts to several dollars a day for a student who really gets down to work and, and learns something. Why wouldn't that be an extremely efficient use of, of educational money? You say, oh, well, lots of parents uh, wouldn't, wouldn't make any difference, but they've been paying the taxes. If they get a little bit back this way, that's all right. And those who aren't paying the taxes are those to whom we have to give money anyway for other reasons, and I don't see any reason why we shouldn't give it this way. Often teachers complain that the family or the home is not involved in education. Well, can you imagine the involvement? <laughs> the involvement on the breakfast table uh, when, the, say, three children are going off that day to school and are going to come back with chits indicating that the family is now eight or ten dollars better off than it was when they left in the morning. Or, and, the, and, the, and the children themselves, of course, picking up some of this for, to, to spend. I see no objection to this, really. Now, in institutions, of course, you have a greater leverage. There's an amazing experiment done at what used to be called a reformatory. It's a national training school for boys in Washington, D.C., in which juvenile delinquents, and they were very serious juvenile delinquents, they were armed robbers, rapists, murderers, were given an entirely new environment to live in. Instead of being coerced into studying something part of the, of the day and coerced into behaving themselves the rest of the time, they were permitted to do entirely as they pleased, in the sense that they could, if they wanted to, simply sleep on a pad in the dormitory, eat nutritious but not very interesting food, and sit around all day on a bench. But if they wanted to improve their lot, they could do so. They could earn points exchangeable for much better food. They could rent a private room. They could get access to pool tables and, and other entertainment devices, colored television. They could rent their own television set. They could even buy a day or two off. I visited that experiment, and there was a murderer out on the town. Um, they had their fingers crossed. He'd bought a weekend off, as a matter of fact, because he was very bright. And, um, and, he, and he came back. Well, the effect on the morale of the place was, was amazing, and the effect on the students were, was amazing, because the way you earned the points was to learn something. There were programs, you worked your way through, and you got points. There were other materials, and you passed tests, and you got points. And these kids who had been rejected by the school systems to which they had gone, they'd been convinced that they were idiots, discovered they could learn something. And many of them learned a great deal. And when they left the school, they were therefore naturally better prepared to lead the kinds of lives that would keep them out of trouble. And the recidivism uh, records show that that was actually the case. I was very pleased to see that Justice Berger recently proposed that prisoners be given time off, that their sentences be, be abridged if they learn things while they are in prison. And presumably, they would do this in, in, uh, in such a way that when they left prison, they would they'd be much better prepared to lead acceptable legal lives. Well, this is the kind of thing that can be done when you take seriously the problem of finding positive reasons why people will get an education. 
And it isn't just something that can be done in institutions or with small children. It can be done all the way up through graduate school. One of the most interesting recent advances is a system proposed by Professor Fred S. Keller, now of Western Michigan at Kalamazoo, formerly of, of Columbia University. The Keller system, now being very widely used throughout the country, works something like this. You take an introductory course, let us say, in psychology. Very often psychologists try these things first. You break the material down into small packages with small tests which tell you whether the package has been mastered or not. And the student then starts in, working pretty much on his own. And when he has mastered one unit, he's able to go on to another, but not until. And when he gets a little way along in the course, he then becomes a proctor who helps beginning students with their material. And strangely enough, it's quite reinforcing to a student to become a proctor. Most of they, they, they like this position. They like being able to tell people who are not as bright as they are what they should know, or at least not as far advanced. And I think we've all had that experience that you never really learn as well as when you're when you're teaching. I, I know I barely kept ahead of my classes the first year I became am a teacher. And this is, is working remarkably well. The, the students uh, report, uh, well, they've been questioned about this, that they they feel they have a greater understanding of the material, that they remember it better, and this is confirmed by the tests which have been given. They have greater feelings of achievement. They like going at their own speed, and they like being proctors, and they like having proctors help them when they've not advanced very far themselves. Now, there's a very interesting bonus to all of this programmed idea, especially the Keller system. If you design a course that way, you don't need to have a final test. The course itself is the test. If you get through the course, you know the material. The little tests aren't the kinds of things we're talking about. They are correct samples of what is being measured. But you don't need that final examination, which gives you an A or a B or a C or a D or, or an E. But you don't need to sample the achievement of the student. You've got it all there. It's all been accomplished. And it has all been learned within reason and with very good retention. What does a C ordinarily mean in the course? It means you have a smattering of the whole course. A C in this system means you've got halfway through. And you keep on, you'll get all the way through and get an A, and everyone should get an A who gets through the course because you don't get through it unless you actually know it. And when you teach this way, students know that they've learned something, and the teacher knows that he has taught something. And both of those are, are great advances, great achievements. Classroom management, Program instruction, all of these things are just the beginning. There, there's gold in those mountains. There is much more in the experimental analysis of behavior than has yet been applied because there aren't very many people familiar with the basic research who are interested in applying it to education. But more and more is being done, and I think we can look forward to a very effective improvement in the process of teaching which has solved many of our problems. Now, there are, of course, many practical problems remaining. The very process of allowing the individual student to go at his own rate demands architectural changes in school. It demands a different uh, kind of role on the part of the teacher. The whole idea of teaching more effectively means trouble. If you can, in the first grade, teach what is now taught in the first and second grade, what's the second grade teacher going to do? And if then uh, he or she teaches what is now taught in the third or fourth, what's going to happen then? Actually, there has been clear evidence that with improved teaching, you can move instruction down to earlier age levels. The best example I know of that is some material designed by Professor Lehman Allen, who's a law professor at Yale. He worked out a course in logic to be used for law students. It worked so well there, he decided he might as well try it at the college level, and he did. And it worked so well there, he thought he might as well try it in high school, and he did. And it worked very well there, and I recently ran into a friend of mine who had a child in the sixth grade in the New Haven School who had Professor Lehman Allen's course in logic. It had moved all the way down from graduate school to the sixth grade. But there are problems there, too. Supposing, it, supposing we can teach twice as much for the same time and effort, that would mean that you get through high school at a very tender age, 
And what would happen to the unemployment figures uh, then when you dump people on the market? The whole system is structured in such a way that no one really wants to improve education. That's the trouble. There are reasons why um, these things are opposed not only for the practical points I've suggested, but theoretical issues. There are, there's a feeling that somehow or other these techniques depersonalize instruction, that the teacher who is out of touch with the student going at his own rate is missing some chance to, to interact with him as a person. I would claim on the contrary that one of the great reasons for turning to individualized instruction is that in an ordinary classroom, the teacher is not really in good contact with anyone much of the time. Moreover, I think we need to free the teacher from a lot of drudgery so that he or she can emerge as a human being. And it's particularly important that he or she emerge as a talking human being. This whole idea that we're going to move away from words now, we're not going to need to read because there is television and so on, it's a terrible thing because the invention of verbal behavior was probably the great step in the evolution of, of culture and the evolution of man's future. And if you now backtrack on that and simply create students who have seen it on television or who have seen it in an instructional film, you will have no one who is able to talk to himself or to others and actually no one who is able to think because most thinking is verbal. It's very hard to do anything comparable to verbal thinking in a purely nonverbal way. Well, these are, are some of the problems and I think the solutions to them will determine the future. If we can make teaching more effective, everyone will gain. Thank you very much. You have been listening to Professor B. F. Skinner in a talk on education delivered to the Continuing Education Division of Santa Barbara City College. Dr. Skinner delivered this address while visiting the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions for a conference held to discuss his best-selling book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity. This program originated at the Center in Santa Barbara.